what I hope will come out of Who Not How is really a, it a tremendous amount of time freed up so that you can spend your energy uh, on the most important activities mm -hmm. that produce results. And you'll be a happier person because you can learn a billion different business strategies, but which ones are going to move the needle? I mean, I, in, in, in Genius Network, we talk about uh, elegant ideas where one elegant idea is worth more than a thousand semi-good ideas. Uh, one elegant solution is worth, you know, uh, a thousand semi-good solutions. And so, uh, Dean, um, why is who not how an elegant idea and an elegant solution applied? I want to hear your perspective on this and I want to hear Ben Hardy's perspective on it because I really think Ben... Yeah. Has, has just having to written this book. It's not about just writing. It's about a, a deep dive into this particular subject. And so that's what Ben does. Yeah. Well, part of the most elegant thing is that who not how ultimately allows you to escape gravity. It allows you to get out of the gravity of linear uh, doing anything. Remember when I showed that picture and I showed the time units that it takes to do things. Time is a linear thing that you it has to be established and it has to be experienced in real time. So the only way to learn how to do anything is to invest the time that it takes to learn how to do it. Now, when you're doing that, when you're faced with this, I want a what, I want to do this thing, but I don't know how to do it. So you have to go down this path now and you're writing what I call this blank check for the only non-renewable asset that you have, which is time, to do something that you're not even sure you're going to be able to know, learn how to do well or how long it's going to take you to do it. And so you go down that path. And then once you learn how to do it, you're still not done because now you just get to the point where you could actually attempt to do the thing that some units of time ago you didn't know how to do. And of course, like anything, the first time you do anything, you're probably going to do it poorly and slowly and probably with mistakes. So you have to redo the thing that you did. And all these units of time that are taking up your prize jewel, which is your attention, your focused attention on something is gone. Now, if you take the who path and you find somebody who knows how to do whatever it is, they're going to bring the how with them. And you immediately get this fast pass to the end of that line. They don't have to, first of all, they don't have to know how to do it. They don't have to figure out how to do it. They've got the knowledge. So now they just need to do it. And because it's what they do, they're going to be able to do it much faster than you would be able to do it at their expert level of getting it done. And you get a predictable outcome because they're presenting themselves as a reliable someone who can do that. Now, once you've got this capability stack, once you've got this, uh, you know, Dan mentioned the words cash confidence, the next level of this is capability confidence. If you've got now the capability to do anything that anybody knows how to do, it's, it changes your vision, right? Now you don't have to limit your vision to what this, I was just contemplating on this in my journal over the weekend that you don't, I don't have to limit my vision to what I know how to do. I can expand my vision to what the world knows how to do. Because now I've got access through Cloudlandia to every capability in the world. And it's a multiplier. And that's what's really where we, you know, we're talking about this. That's the biggest thing that we're doing now is this migration as a society to Cloudlandia where the rules are different. It's not a linear. We're in a digital and a multiplier kind of a uh, atmosphere. The atmosphere is different, right? So you get to move about that faster. The pull of gravity is different. Just like when you go to the moon or you go to Mars, the pull of gravity is less. So you don't, it takes less work to, to do things. That's what we get now if we embrace this who, not how, uh, you know, setup. And equip ourselves with finding who's. That's where something like 
a like genius network is a way to expose yourself to who's who know how to do stuff and to expose yourself to ideas what's yeah well you yeah. know that's that, that's okay. the way that i you know what dean i think of um what are the connections because if there's anything that really is about what i attempt to do is i is, is to connect people i want to connect people with the right ideas the right methodologies i want to disconnect them from the things that cause them suffering which is why I do so much work in the addiction recovery world and I want to connect them with the right who's. So Genius Network is like a giant who network. And I think that's why many people invest to come to Genius Network is so they, they don't have to go find these who's. The who's are there and I, I assemble them. So the question becomes, how do we access them? I've read through some of the comments uh, and certainly there's so many, I can't read through them and, and stay focused yeah. at the same time. I, I pop in and look at a few of them. Yeah. And there was one early on along the lines of, you know, but aren't the, the who's really expensive and finding the right who's. And so I have a couple of thoughts I want to ask you, you guys about. And when I say you guys, I mean, uh, Dan and, and Ben and, and you, Dean, um, where is, there's that one line, which is uh, hire the best and only cry once right? Ah. Versus, you know, don't hire the best and cry many times. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. The other is a lot of who's don't require money. I mean, if you mm -hmm. actually, you know, I have a tool in Eunice, who's up in the room. Can you get, I'll at some point, I'll bring it up. My genius network. Can you grab me that tool, please? Thank you. And so, um, you know, like a who for me is my assistant, uh, Eunice. I mean, she's been with me for 25, is it 25 years? Are you now 26 years, 25 years. Yeah, she's going to, after 26, she's probably done. No, but the, the so the, the thing is, is like, if you just simply are helpful to people, a lot of who's you already know, but you haven't thought of them. Thank you so much. Like I have a tool in Genius Network called My Genius Network. And we have people write down who it's for. And then I have these, you know, these circles, which I started this as one of the first tools in Genius Network, where it's like you in the middle, see this little, uh, can you see it? Okay, a little red person. And then there's these circles. And I would have people write the name of, uh, like, if you think of the eight most important people in your life, uh, you know, who would you put? And then you'd put the skill or capability underneath. That's one way to use it to identify, you know, who's your genius network. Another way is say you want to get in better physical shape. Who are people that you know that are geniuses at eating and exercise and nutrition? Maybe a yoga instructor, maybe, uh, you know, a massage therapist that can help you in health, uh, any type of trainer. You can, if you want to write a book, who are the right who's? So what happened in Genius Network, Tucker Max, Reed Tracy, uh, Ben Hardy, Scott, you know, I mean, there's different individuals that allowed this who not how book to happen. But the way it works is, is then I have people transfer the name of who are they? Who, and see, it says right here, it says who, right? I've been doing this for 15 years. Genius or wisdom they have. What's the genius or wisdom? How can I help them? And then how can they help me? And that's where everyone that is not a collaborator messes it up when working with who's is they always think about, oh, I want to meet this person so I can get something for me instead of what does this person actually, how can I help them? And there's this wonderful thing that my dear buddy, uh, Robert Cialdini, who wrote the book Influence, has been writing about for 30 years called reciprocity. And, you know, when you are helpful to people, they naturally want to help you back. And so whatever who's that you want to identify in your life, there's plenty of things if you just thought about it. Uh, and the book is a roadmap. That's why you need to read the book. The book actually explains what to do and how to do it. Uh, you can uh, you can literally develop the skills of making yourself such an incredible asset. So we're, you're a who for many people. I mean, how many of you, you know that you're somebody's who? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of stuff that I suck at that I have no clue how to do. And then I could learn how to do it or I could just find someone that already knows it because Ben and Dan and Dean have said it already. You know, if you find the right who they bring the how with them. <laughs> and I can't imagine how much of my time I wasted trying to learn things that if I just would ask the question, which is early on in the book, Ben actually lays out. Here's the distinction between two different questions you ask yourself, not how do I do something, but who and really take that seriously. And then if you operate from a standpoint of not a taker but a genuine giver, not even with an agenda. I mean, most of the things that come to me, it's not, you know, I'm the same person to someone that's holding the door open for me that I don't know. Or if I'm at a restaurant and someone is serving me something, I mean, I've said this before, who becomes my true friends, or I look at people that are more powerful. How do they treat people that are less powerful than them? 
I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be helpful and courteous to a lot of people when it comes to your time, your energy, your effort and your unique ability. If you if you direct that in the right ways and you find the right who's to do everything else, not only do I think will your income dramatically multiply, your free time will dramatically increase if that's what you want, but your happiness will be much bigger. So Dave Astreen, who, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, he's the one uh, with Charlie who was doing the meetup groups. He had a question about, uh, Dave, are, can you unmute yourself and ask Dan that question that you private messaged me? Yeah. Uh, first off, I wanted to say real quick that I'm the perfect example of you and Gina. You know, I asked you, should I join Genius Network first or strategic coach? And, uh, about a year and a half ago, you told me strategic coach and, uh, I'm so glad you did. I just signed up for my second year. And I told Dan at the uh, morning buffet that the first before the first meeting even started that I already got my money back tenfold on it because the prep work changed my thinking already so much that it's just been phenomenal. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a living story of that reciprocity back and forth between you two. Uh, So, Dan, my question was, if you can touch on a little bit about your concept of unique ability and how that applies to finding the right who. Yeah, I think that, um, and this is just my experience. Now I have, uh, you know, kind of uh, a different kind of experience for because for the last 46 years, uh, virtually all my focus, my relationships, uh, you know, my productivity has been geared just to uh, people who are really outliers. You know, they're, they're not normal people. And, uh, entrepreneurs are are really outside the norm um, because most people don't choose to um, you know earn their income that way. They're not willing to take the risks, uh, and it's lonely. The other thing is the the biggest um, single problem of entrepreneurism is loneliness. Uh, if they're addicted to something, it's because they're lonely. If they're uh, you know they're they're unsuccessful in their personal life, it's because of loneliness. And if they get blocked in their business, it's because they don't have anyone to talk to who gets them. You know, they just don't have anyone to talk to them. So what I say is um, every every human being has a unique ability and it has two features. One is it comes to you effortlessly. It's a thing that's so easy for you. You can't understand why other people don't do it. Okay. In other words, well, that's real simple. You just do this, this and this and this. Uh, and that tells you it's a unique ability. And the other thing is, it's actually very enjoyable to you. you I mean, you, you like being in this activity, uh, but you don't take it seriously because it's easy. And you've been told uh, that there, if there's no pain, there's no gain. If, if it doesn't take a long time, if it isn't hard, it, it won't be valuable to you. And uh, my sense is, well, first of all, that may have been true a hundred years ago. It may have been true, but once you have the internet and once you have, uh, you know, as Dean talks about Quadlandia, all the rules of the world change. They they change. If it if it isn't easy for you, then you know it's easy for someone else. Just so just find out the person who it's easy for, and you know right off the bat that if you ask them to do it, they'll love doing it. And uh, Dave, I'd just like to get across a distinction here because you're in your second, you know, you're in your second year of coach. Who's your who's your coach, by the way? Chad Johnson. Oh, yeah. Chad's a wonderful person. By the way, he has 11 children and they're all homeschooled. They're all (laughs) homeschooled. So anyway, um, the 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 thing about it is um, this is not delegation. Okay, so I want to make a sharp distinction here. That who not how's is uh, not delegation. And a lot of entrepreneurs really hate delegation. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video. And I want to let you know that I have a new book that's come out. And if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there is a link below in the description. Or you can wait till the end of this video. Or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. And the reason is because... The person they're delegating to, they think is not as good as them. They're maybe 80% as good. And then they're going to have to train that person, which they don't really, really like doing. And then once the person does it, they're going to have to manage that person, which they really don't like doing. And then if it's a failure, then you got to start all over again. Um, So the distinction I like, who not how, 
is that you're going to someone who's way better than you. You're not going to someone who, and you don't have to train them in anything. You don't have to manage them at all. They, they, what they like is that you're using their skills to achieve your goal. And uh, if you utilize people's skills in an exciting project, they'll even do it for free. They'll even do it for free because the world doesn't give them many opportunities to use their skill and you're giving them a skill. And so um, uh, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, the biggest who, not how of my life is Babs, Babs, uh, Babs Smith, who's my partner. So we've been together for 38 years. And uh, just to give you a test of how good this collaboration is, when the COVID started, and the pandemic started, our, our way of making money was completely ended because we do in-person workshops, okay? And so uh, within two days, the whole company switched from in-person backstage to virtual. And within 10 days, we had gone virtual with our offering and uh, all of our workshops are, are, are in-person. And now we're starting virtual only workshops so people will only and uh we just had our first 60 people and they come from 21 countries so my feeling is that being forced to uh go virtual will take us 10 times in about the next 10 years uh just because our market expanded by now 100 times with that but i will tell you this this is seven months we did the transition and i didn't spend one hour on that transit transition wow. I didn't spend one hour Babs and the team and our tech department and everybody else. They did the whole transition. I didn't do anything. So I was completely free just to go on working with Ben, creating new workshops the way I normally. My life was not changed at all. I, I didn't change. And because Babs runs the company and she's my who who runs the company, and I, I'm just responsible for what's presented new in the workshops. So uh, you know, I mean, and the first time I met her, I showed her my thinking and she, uh, I used her company. I took her through my company, through my thinking process. And she says, uh, this is going to be really big. And I said, oh, you think your company is going to grow? She said, no, no, your process is going to be really big. And about two years later, she said, forget my company. I want to run your company. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And she's really, Babs, uh, Babs is so magical. She doesn't even know what the magic trick is. I mean, she just has a phenomenal ability of putting teams together of people. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, she, she's created the whole company. I often say if I hadn't met Babs, I'm, I'm just a smart drunk worried about the rent. Yeah, well, you know, and it all goes to, to, with what you said about being nice to people, because it's like one of my favorite quotes. I don't even know who originated is be yeah. nice to the people you meet on the web because they're going to be say I'm on the way down. Yeah, so exactly. That's so certainly true. And you've seen people like that that are yeah. just mean spirited and that and then you don't hear about them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the mean, you know, the mean ones, they, they kind of pushed their way in there. But I think uh, the tur tortoise and the hare, you know, I'm a big tortoise guy. Right. I think the tortoise just building your brand and having a huge foundation. My, my team was just in Vegas at the licensing show. And what they realized is people used to try to invent brands, you know, like facades. Mm -hmm. This is this is a real brand. This How is would a you brand that's it? built on, on actually accomplishing important things in the world. Yeah. Um, Disney you... has accomplished great things in the world. But everybody thinks that, well, you know, I can do a mouse and some uh, imitations don't work. Yeah. The original. First. It's a real substance to it. Yeah, right? get some substance to it, live it, you know, dream it, and then share it. But um, my foundation and, and my brand is built on accomplishing super high goals uh, in the areas of, of the environment, protecting the environment. Well, yeah, what's interesting is, is, is your, your belief in sustaining things, and even in your bathroom here, which I think is kind of funny, there's a little sign that says, keep it nicer than it was before you showed up. And that's kind of your philosophy, where you, you, you yeah. want things to be left in a better place than they were before you showed up. You know, the ocean, everything. Well, you know, and I, nobody's perfect either, but you don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is do a little better, mm -hmm. okay? So if everybody does a little better, and, and what's ironic is uh, if everybody does a little bit, you can make a world of difference. You know, in the, in the, in the last century, it was all about, like Jacques Cousteau, he, he went out himself and did things. Now it's about partnerships. Uh, so we're partnered with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. They do the greatest science, you know, on oceans and water. 
and then we bring the art. So when two groups come together in that mastermind theory, you can accomplish big things. When a lot of groups and individuals come to, together, you know, they can change the world. Absolutely. And I'm here to help change the world uh, just in my little part, my little art part that I know. And, you know, writers, uh, you know, people say, you know, do what you know. Um, I've always known the art thing. You know, it's instinctive to me. But the greatest reward that you can have is when you share it with somebody and they appreciate it. The little lights come on, especially in those young eyes and minds. It's a great thing. Well, okay, so let's talk about your foundation and people that are watching this and they'd want to get involved. They want to find more information. Keyword, about it. get want... involved. Get involved how, in how do they any do that? foundation that you feel strongly about. Mine is the Wyland Foundation. We celebrate our 16 years uh, this year. And in those 16 years, we've developed art and science programs that are unparalleled, that, that regard every drop of water on the planet. And using the art component, you know, you can go further. Art can go deeper. So, but using art and science together, it's, it's, it's super powerful. Usually there's a curriculum on science or art. We combine both creatively. And we use some of the greatest scientists on the planet. Dr. Sylvia Earle, for instance, is on the Wyland Foundation board, and Bob Ballard, who discovered Titanic. And then, uh, you know, our creative team, uh, we really don't follow any rules. We're here to break down all the barriers and all the rules and just say that uh, what we're providing is unique in, in the world of education. Out of all the books you've, you've written, is there anything you'd recommend where to start for anyone that wants more information about you? I mean, what's the... Yeah, I say go to Wyland.com, W-Y Land, get it? Y Land. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go to Wyland.com, you can see all my books there. There's one called Hold Your Water kind of an unusual title, and it gives you 67 things to do to keep the planet blue, the ocean blue. And in the back, you can total little things you can do uh, to protect the quality of water. And by protecting water, by protecting the energy and shutting off the lights and the water when you're brushing your teeth, you're actually saving money too. So kids, you're doing your family a favor. You're, you're doing good things in this economy. So uh, you're gonna see the gr green revolution really to take hold with Obama. And uh, if you're not green in this century, you're gone. So I'm gonna give you a heads up, go green. Well, yeah, if anyone has a perspective on that, it would be yeah. you. Now, uh, at, at your foundation meeting that I first met you at, I met Jane Seymour there. She, right, you're collaborating. Miss Jane, her. sure. Yes, and she's a very nice lady. Jane is awesome. She's an up and coming artist, emerging artist. She's also an official U.S. Olympic artist, like I am, supporting our U.S. Olympic team through the arts. And uh, she's she's super cool. She cares about water. She's one of those givers too. You know, Jane doesn't have to do any more than she already does, but she's she's a, a real genuine uh, person. That, that cares about uh, certain issues, you know, and she has, she has her open hearts. All right, Jane. Anyway, what's cool is if all the people, all the good people on the planet unite, we, we can have a, a, not only um, a great society, great kids, but we can have a clean, healthy ocean and environment and, and, and clean lakes, rivers, streams, ponds, wetlands. We have a beautiful, pristine environment to help of the ocean and clean water is tied not only to fish but to our health okay that's a health issue that we need to get in front of and that's why i'm so passionate about it plus water has played the most important role of all in my life i'm a water sign you know and when i'm immersed in water i'm reborn i feel i'm great. aquarius by the way just so you know there you go. Okay. all right man. so all the water signs out there but water is so critical and it's important to get in front of issues not Oh, by the way, you know, we don't have any more water to drink. So uh, I believe the investment that I've made with my Wyland Foundation is the most important investment of all, and that's educating and inspiring kids to, to get involved today in issues that they strongly believe in. And art is the gateway to all that creativity and all that soul. Because if people see the beauty in nature, they'll work to preserve it. And art is a great way to uh, present that. That's awesome. Well. I want to wrap up here. I want to just give you an opportunity for famous last words. We'll do that. One, one, one last question. Famous Excuse me. Then famous words, last okay. word. I'll give you. I'll give you a chance to maybe think about it. Right. Um, when you get discouraged, when you get overwhelmed, when anyone that's watching this is like gets derailed. I mean, what recommendations would you have? Because you're, you know, you have a lot of insight on a lot of things, uh, and you deal a lot with the creative mind. I mean, the mind can 
invent and, 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 and develop so many enormous things. And it could also be a, a huge form of self-destruction for someone too. And I've seen a lot of artists go off the deep end. Yeah. Um, what recommendations or, or things you could you share with, with people? On I this? always say, uh, go back to your core, go back to the things that, that give you joy and go back there often. I mean, the thing that gives me joy, I'm a diver. I like being immersed in water. Okay. If I can't get in the ocean, I'm in my bathtub up there. I don't care. Yeah. There's something about water that reinvigorates your soul. And so, uh, you know, and then getting close to animals. You know, the native people would tell me, uh, if you're eye to eye with a bald eagle, that's the highest level of consciousness. Well, for me, being in the sea, swimming eye to eye with a humpback whale, I mean, it's unbelievable. Why yeah. whales? Why whales? Well, a whale has been iconic to me ever since Cousteau. And then eventually, as I started diving and I started getting close to whales on their terms, I realized that the whales don't have a voice. So maybe I could be the voice for, for great whales and, and other life animals. And I've expanded not only from whales to other aquatic animals, but freshwater habitats and now land animals, realizing that the forest the land, the air, the sea, it's all connected. If we're going to protect the ocean, we need to protect it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, famous last words then. Famous last words. This is a good wild one. <laughs> There's two types of people. There's anchors and motors. Lose the anchors, get with the motors. That's awesome. And let's get the job done. It's a race to save the planet. The motors are going to lead the way. Out of... If you can, one of the best ways to build rapport with someone is to identify an area of mutual suffering and pain. The reason 12-step groups work um, is because there's a community of people that have been through pain. And when prisoners of war um, would go to therapists and psychologists and stuff and they would not get any help, but then they would take those same people and, and put them into a room with other people that have been through the the, the, the horrible situations they've been, there'd be instant rapport. Now, to put that in a positive light, one thing that I do with a lot of people that I meet, and I've met some very famous people, um, and I'm good friends with them, I haven't just met them, I've developed relationships with them, is I have the, the understanding that most human beings are just insane and completely fucked up on many different levels. And, uh, and I'm not saying that like to be just for effect. It's, it's true. I mean, people are people and they have issues and they, have, they enjoy having fun. They like building rapport. And I just like goofing around. I don't think that someone is like God or some Messiah unless, you know, I run into God or Messiah. Um, so Evan, you know, shoots an email over to Tony. Uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Shay. Shay. Because I always say his last name. Tony Shay. He's the guy that's the CEO of Zappos. And I've met him before. Um, but, you know, he's, he had dinner with, uh, with uh, Eben went, went and had dinner with him with Joe Sugarman, who's a good friend of mine, the founder of Blue Blocker Sunglasses, and sends back an email to Tony saying, you got to connect with Joe. And then he uh, also demeaned me in the uh, email in a very funny way. But that built instant rapport because he just knew, yeah, it's cool to talk shit, you know. Yeah. And so I shoot back another email kind of doing the same thing. And all of a sudden, you know, now we're going to do a tour of Zappos and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Going to do an interview with him. And that's just a real simple, quick connection. So when you meet other connected people, just become buddies and, you know, they'll introduce you to everybody. You, and... Um, one of the things, just some stuff that everyone can do, uh, if you want to meet someone, first off, find their birthday. Know everyone's birthday that you want to meet. Send them cards, send them gifts. Before the holidays, send them stuff. Uh, Robert Cialdini, who's a good friend of mine, he wrote a great book called Influence. And there's a chapter on reciprocity. Learn to use reciprocity. Giving things to people will help you tremendously. But don't just give them goofy, silly things. Find out things that they really would find valuable and interesting. Um, in terms of, you know, gifts, um, if they have any sort of pain... You know, hang on a sec. On, yeah. on that, uh, just to give you a, a window inside of uh, Joe's mind and how he thinks, um, just an experience that I had with him. Uh, I was out uh, with you, I think it was after one of your big seminars a few years ago, and you needed to buy, you needed to buy a ladder for something. 
and we're out driving around to find a ladder. You want to change a light bulb or something? And I'm like, why don't you just have somebody else do it? And you're like, because I want to buy a ladder and I want to change. And, you know, I know it was after a seminar, so you were just winding down. And like, I just want to get out and be a regular person for a little while. So we went over to, uh, I think we went to Costco. And do you remember this? Uh, no, I'm no? trying to figure out what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I, I really want to give you like the model of how a genius thinks, all right? Just like a window inside of his mind, like a perspective you, you wouldn't normally get. So we're walking down. Uh, the, the aisles in Costco and trying to find a ladder and we're looking at a bunch of different things and you know whenever like two people that are interested in the world go out we're talking about what's going on in Costco and we come around one of the end caps it's you know the huge piles of goods and stuff they have there and Joe's standing there and he's like wow look at that, that that's aw like hmm that's awesome and I'm looking and it's these boxes that are, whoa, they're probably about, you know, two feet wide and three feet tall and about, I don't know, eight inches thick. And they're these big, like, porcelain Dutch figurines, like yard figurines. And it was a big box that, I mean, probably weighed like 40 or 50 pounds. And Joe's like, that's great. He's going, he goes, you know, that's the kind of thing that you, like, send to someone on their birthday or for Christmas with, like, a really thoughtful card. And they go, what the hell am I gonna do with this? <laughs> and then when, when you come over, they've gotta like put him outside on their lawn. And he's like, just he's, he was mesmerized. He was like, I could see the wheels turning. Like, this is amazing, this is great. Cause they were like 20 bucks for the whole no, set. No, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I mean, I set Marty Edelston, one of those little samurai guys. You see those in the airplane magazines, the sumo dude, they're, they're, not, they're like 95 bucks. I've probably sent 10 of those to people. What the hell are you doing with it? You gotta, they, they can, they're always forced to have to think about you. When they, and, uh, that's actually, you know, I, I don't remember that, but that's the sort of stuff I do all the time. So, yeah, Marty Edelston loves that thing. He's the guy that owns Boardroom Inc. Uh, you know, I mean, now he sends me, he sends me a personal letter at least every three weeks um, and has done so for at least three years. Uh, and this is a guy that's running a $100 million a year company that's just a great dude. But it all started with sending goofy stuff to each other. I yeah, every three a, weeks, Joe gets a letter that says, where'd you get the Dutch figurines? No, no, he writes, you should see the crazy shit that Marty sends me. He's, he's <laughs> twisted. But um, um, yeah, so, you know, find something that they would really find interesting. Send them weird gifts. Send them cool stuff. Uh, if they have any sort, you know, let me, let me do like the, the strategic stuff. Being a marketer, uh, I learned a lot of, uh, most, uh, I learned marketing from Gary Halbert, who was brilliant and uh, demonic and uh, neurotic and weird, but just a genius. And um, he said that one of the things that lacks in most marketing is theater. So you want to be theatrical in the stuff that you do. So for instance, if I was, if I wanted to meet a big wig, I mean, I've never had a situation where I've wanted to meet someone that I've not been able to meet. And um, it's gotten me into, you know, I mean, the stuff that, um, what I would do, for example, if I wanted to meet someone and I had a message I needed to convey to them, I would get a little mini DVD player. I would shoot a video of yourself, put it in the DVD player. I would send them a mini DVD player with a post-it note on the top of it that said, you know, press, open this up and press play. And I would send that DVD player to them by uniform courier that they personally have to sign for. So it gets through all the gatekeepers and everything. It gets right into their hands, or at least their you know, key right-hand person's hands, and just get it to them that way. You know, stuff like that. Simple to do. Might cost you $100, $200, but you know, to me, it's a more effective use of time than calling someone 50 times. Uh, but what Evan was saying is, yeah, you know, be persistent to a point, but, you know, be persistent in a smart way. Uh, do things, you know, send them letters with a hundred dollar bill attached to them. Always be willing to pay for someone's time. If you want to talk to somebody, sometimes just hire them. Cut a check. I mean, I've always been willing to, to cut a check. What you said uh, here is that you, you, you were having the, I don't know the, the person, but you said, uh, uh, oh, when you were um, wanting to find out how to expand uh, in foreign markets, you talked to someone and, and you said tens of thousands of dollars was rolling out of their mouth. I think that's something that you just said uh, 15 minutes ago. I wrote a picture of a mouth, a head with diamonds rolling out and I'm gonna have my artist actually illustrate someone talking and all these gems just coming out of them. And 
one conversation could be worth a million dollars to you. And people are so cheap. I mean, they're just not willing to cut a check. And if you have enough money to solve a problem, you don't have a problem. That's what Dan Sullivan says. And so be willing to cut a check and meet the person. Uh, another thing is, you know, people come up to me all the time and they're like, oh, let's do this, let's do that. First off, my filter immediately is, well, have they ever bought anything of mine? Do they, have they done any research whatsoever about what, they want me to sell their dog food, but do they eat my dog food? And so one of my criteria is I have a $25,000 person coaching group and people come to me and they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna make a ton of money together. It's like, well, you know, then one of the filters is if we're gonna make so much money together, then join one of my groups and then we'll spend time together and don't do it because that means we're gonna do a joint venture, do it because you sincerely want to work with me. If not, then all I am is a financial target and access to a list or something. So I try to think about, do they actually really care? Like if someone wants to meet, and do something with you, you know, I mean, you're gonna respect someone more that's an actual client, someone that really appreciates you, uh, and, and you know, they study your work. Um, so pay for their time. Uh, always say please and thank you uh, a lot. Um, really acknowledge people, uh, thank them. Uh, you know, and this applies to anyone, even if you want nothing out of it. I mean, pe people that are rude to waiters and people that are just rude in general, they, they really don't get that far, you know, it's like the whole saying, be nice to the people you meet on the way up because they're going to be the same people you meet on the way down. You know, just start living your life that way. And uh, you'll, you'll the, the one thing that you have got to protect more than anything else is your reputation. Just constantly create value for people and operate and live that way. And by living that way in a very karmic way, opportunities will just present themselves to you that won't exist for people that aren't that way. Um, so connect with their friends, uh, with their, you know, for instance, one of the people that I want to, I met Bill Gates at All Things Digital uh, earlier in the year, and I took a picture with me and Bill Gates, and I talked with him for just a couple minutes uh, about doing an interview, but I know that Bill's like in another world, as are most billionaires, and uh, so I talked to his wife, Melinda, and I'm going to do my best to set up a interview with her about the uh, foundation that they have, the, 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 the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that will eventually lead to something with uh, Bill, very much the same way that I, I ended up developing the relationship with uh, Richard Branson. I really admire what he was doing with Virgin Unite, his charity, which he fully funds and supports out of pocket, so 100% of the money from that uh, charity goes to the front lines of all the different things they do, from homelessness in America to teaching entrepreneurism uh, in Africa to all kinds of stuff. And I interviewed the lady that ran Virgin Unite, Jean Olwang, and of course Richard really liked that, and that eventually led to me doing an interview with Richard, him speaking at one of my conferences, and now we're doing trips to Necker Island once a year in, in raising money for uh, Virgin Unite. But find out who they're top people are and do something and work with them. Another clever technique, which everyone could use, because it is a technique, there are some things you just sincerely do because you're talented and skilled, and there's other ways to trick people into talking to you. So if you've got no ability to talk to anyone and you just want to use marketing tricks, that works to a certain point. Um, one of the things you can do, and I learned this from Brad Atten years ago, I teach carpet cleaners how to basically sell carpet cleaning services. That's how I got into my marketing business. I was a dead broke carpet cleaner living off credit cards and I needed to eat. And so I had to figure out how to learn how to sell stuff in order to survive. And all of the stuff I do today is purely an accident. It's a strategic byproduct of having to figure out how to make my carpet cleaning business work. And uh, it's weird where life takes you, believe me. That and enough drugs, you can go anywhere in life. And uh, so, uh, one of the things that I've taught a lot of my carpet cleaners to do, because they need to go in and do bids in commercial buildings, and they need to talk to the right person. They always have these gatekeepers. So what I have them do, and I learned this from a couple of marketers from years ago named Brad and Alan Anton, is you call up their assistant and you find out the person that you want to talk to, he or she, their, their shoe size, and say, you know, I want to send them a pair of shoes as a gift. Uh, can you find out the shoe size for me? Now, they always... They, all, they will do this for you because they think it's kind of cool. No one calls up and says, hey, what's the shoe size? They're like, all right, what the hell? And um, so you find out the person's shoe size. Say it's like size 10. What you do is you go down to you know, a, 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 any store and you buy like a pair of Nikes or Reeboks uh, for 70 or 100 bucks. And you take one of the shoes and you write a note that says, dear 
Mr. Bigwig, Mr. and Mrs. Bigwig, I have something really important I want to share with you. And I, I felt the best way to get my, uh, you know, my foot in the door was to send you a shoe. And I'd like to meet with you. And when we meet, I'll bring the other shoe. And then you send one shoe to them with a little handwritten note. Send it uniform courier so it goes directly to them. And here's the deal. Anyone that's an entrepreneur has no one that works for them that thinks like that. And they just appreciate creativity. Isn't it true? I mean... Honestly, when you, when you go out into the regular world, not places like this where people actually think, you know, it's like amazing to see like creative people. And every carpet cleaner, I've had, I've taught that to so many people, everyone that actually does it, I say, if you send 10 pairs of shoes to any big commercial account, I guarantee you, you're going to land a 10 or $20,000 job. Always. Net, but here's the deal, one out of 100 people that I'll tell that to actually will ever do it. But the people that do it, they always get in. Send coffee mugs, send anything, but just that's theater. That's what I mean by being sending theater. Send in a DVD player, send in a little flip video with a recording of yourself saying something, you know, Bob, I wanted you to have this really cool camcorder, but press press play. Every single person here could do something like that. That's, that's something. And then, of course, I have to come back to Demi them in front of their their friends um, uh, if when you can really I have built more rapport with people with very sick twisted really bad very bad uh, forms of humor in front of them just to know that hey the person's really chummy and it instantly breaks down walls because people are constantly walking around trying to be all professional and I know that everybody, no matter who they are, is a hosed up human being that has some area of their life that's completely dysfunctional. And the moment you can get into that, it just takes down walls. It just be fun. I mean, people just love people that are fun and, and be a ray of sunshine as best you can. And Eben, I don't you know, know if I wanna, there's- I wanna underscore a couple of things you said. Contacting someone and saying, I'd like to hire you to do something. I'd like to buy an hour of your time. Very powerful. I mean, I can think of three people that come to mind, uh, all of whom you know, uh, that I've hired to do an hour on the telephone. The lowest, uh, in the last couple of years, the lowest uh, cost one was $1,000 for an hour, and the highest one was 2,500 bucks for an hour on the phone. And you know what? They gave me great information. They gave me great advice. And you know what else? Now I can call any one of them anytime I want and talk to them because I made friends with them. You know, do the math. Another thing, uh, you know, you recommended uh, Gene Landrum's book, Profiles of Power and Success. Yeah. Get Gene Landrum's book, Landrum, L-A-N-D-R-U-M, Gene Landrum, Profiles of Power and Success. That, that's a, a very intense book. It is, it's like the, the alternate perspective of the lives of highly successful people. He profiles a bunch of just, you know, super successful people like Walt Disney and uh, oh, I can't think uh, of the Maria Montessori, yeah, the, Hitler, the aviator, Frank Lloyd Wright, Howard, Howard Hughes. Yeah. And you get to just see like all the common denominators of these people. But what you realize is that they're way more screwed up than the average person. And Joe has an intuitive sense of that. He knows that the geniuses are way more screwed up than the average person, and he goes right for the jugular. <laughs> no, and I actually, mean that, I do, and, and it's honestly because I'm I'm as about as dysfunctional as a person could get. And I, when I say goes right for the jugular, I mean it in the funniest way, because he <laughs> makes fun of their foibles, and I mean if he finds something that they're insecure about, he just makes fun of them in front. I mean it's like amazing, but it's it's the, it it's the most profound instant friendship formula that I've seen. Now, I tend to mess with people, too, and that's why oh, the I two asked, of us get in a room. I asked Richard Branson on you know, tape, I said, you know, if you were to get in a fight with Al Gore, you think you could take him? And I mean, and you say, and when I talk to Rupert Murdoch at All Things Digital, you know, I'm talking, I'm like, in front of a huge audience, I'm like, do you believe in God? And he's like, yes, I do. And then I, and then I had a drink with him after the speech. You know, because who the hell says shit like that to Rupert Murdoch? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, those are just, just kind of underscoring a couple of your points. No, and if, you, if you treat, if you meet one of these people and you treat them like they're some perfect high status being and you start acting weird around them and you become all formal and stilted, what are they going to do? Pee wet. 
right? They're going to feel weird, exactly. They're going to be like, okay, another person acting weird around me. On the other hand, if you do what this guy does and says, uh, hi, I'm Joe Polish, do you believe in God? <laughs> or mess with them in any one of a million ways. It's like instant rapport. No, and like one thing which I do in elevators a lot, but you could also do it with really well-known people that everyone's always serious around them, is, uh, you know, you get, the best thing is try it here in an elevator with people you don't know. When it's all silent and there's a room, just turn around and say, can I ask you all a question? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior? <laughs> now, uh, now, just pause enough to say, no, I'm kidding, because you, there's a difference between goofing on people and being cruel. But, you know, your own version of that, because some people, that, that's already offensive to them. But, uh, you know. <laughs> you know, as an alternative, you might try, if the money were right and it could fit into your schedule, do you have a minute to take a look at an opportunity? <laughs> so, exactly. I learned that from my friend Sean back there. And, uh, okay. A good no, one. but see, the weird thing, too, is I've had to figure that out because by, I, I mean, I am, uh, le I, I am a introvert. I am not an extrovert. I have forced myself to have to go out and have to talk to people, especially when you get into the public speaking thing. The first time I ever had to do a public speech, I mean, now I've actually spoken, largest crowd I've spoken in front of is 5,000 people. Um, but man, when I first had to do it, it was just nerve wracking. And the second time I had to do it, it was nerve wracking and it was nerve wracking. But, you know, eventually you just kind of. But but I realized that if I want to get checks, you got to talk to people. You know, that's what the entrepreneurs have to do. So there's one thing that my my good friend Dan Sullivan says uh, is, you know, two things you need to be successful as an entrepreneur. You need uh, courage and ignorance. And I had, a, I had a lot of, a lot of both um, in the very beginning, and, and so I still do. So, you know, first off, be willing, and I've also reframed the thing about rejection and stuff. You know, it's not rejection, it's taking a survey of who has good taste and who doesn't, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but also remember the Wayne Gretzky thing. Always remember when you're thinking about it, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And just go out there and take the shots and just do it because, you know, uh, the world does not re reward um, people that don't go out there and do it, you know. And you only lose if you fail to lose the lesson, you know, stupid little cliches. But here's the other thing, too. I never ask anybody to do anything for me without creating value for them first. And sometimes that value is simply wanting to make them laugh, even with my goofy jokes and the way, I mean, it's truly, I'm tr just trying to be fun with people. I'm trying to make them smile. I'm trying to just have a good time. And if I can't do any of those things, at least I amuse the hell out of myself. Um, but always create value for people. I never ask anybody to do anything for me. Uh, give me an in do an interview with me. And I've interviewed some great, I mean, next week I'm interviewing Hugh Downs on, on video. I've got a verbal agreement from Tiger Woods to do a, uh, a Genius Network interview. Um, you know, part of it is, but I always think of how can I create value for this person? And if you show up with that attitude, you know, the whole, I don't know who originally said it, you know, you can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. So always think about what is the value that you could create, provide, give, offer, link them to. And if you use that approach, you can pretty much meet a lot of people. And when you don't know anyone in the beginning, as a marketer, you have to manufacture your own credibility. That's where learning marketing techniques and things come in. But after you've interviewed someone that's really famous or you know someone that's really connected, it just builds upon it. So in the beginning, it's, you're going to have to build up the, uh, the momentum. But it's a lot easier to maintain momentum than it is to create it. So just be willing to spend a little bit of time creating it and doing some things in the beginning. And just you know, your life and your income and everything will grow as a result of it. And I mean, I could say more, but I'll, I don't want to hog the mic. Thank you. So what does the word connection mean to you? Yeah, it means engaged. It means um, like locked in. You know, mm -hmm. um, for example, with employees, you know, as I tell people, if you haven't grown professionally and personally when you're in this company, I haven't done my job. So we're not just about professional development. That's mm -hmm. why we bring in these radical coaches. We're gonna talk about feelings. People are, you know, and we do it with our whole company, you know, and it's amazing the transformations that happen, but that's connected, like we're locked in yeah. and we're dialed in with you. 
and um, we're here. We're you're committed. Yeah. And let's do this thing. And it's so funny. Like if somebody will say, like, you know, we'll be in a meeting and they'll say, I feel really angry. And this reminds me of when my mom was, you know, when I was young, and we're like, okay, go ahead and process that, and then we'll move <laughs> on. Like that's the way we're doing things. Yeah. Because it really is. There's no difference. Someone just said there's no business problem. It's a personal problem. Who said that this morning? Yeah. That's it. Right. So there is no problem within our business that doesn't go down to our core. Totally. And I'm interested, I'm not interested in making a ton of money. I do. And it's amazing. It's an amazing outpouring. I guess I am interested because it happens. But I'm interested in my own personal development and the personal development around people around me. Yeah. That's the reason. That's fine. I'll be on the floor processing this $30 million deal. You know, yeah. I want to do it. I don't care because I want to get down to that to clear that. Wow. And that's my MO, period. That's awesome. And if you think I'm crazy and stupid, whatever. But this is my commitment. <laughs> no. I think it's great. <laughs> so, uh, what's something it's you? Not normal, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. I mean, that, well, this is the Star Wars bar here. But see, that's the luxury <laughs> when you've lost everything. You're like, I don't care. Like, come yeah. on. This is I'm. This is the way I'm doing it. Yeah. Well, I, I often think that uh, in terms. In look, I mean, this is just, I only see the world through my my own interpretations and viewpoint. I. Uh, I don't think the treadmill of shit in business ever stops. I think it's just nonstop. And it, in many cases, it speeds up and it gets bigger and, and more intense depending on your, your, how much you're, you're growing it. What does change, though, is you. And when you change your tolerance of it or your, uh, like there's, there's one of the signs up here that says don't react, respond. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can respond to life, you're going to just be more functional uh, versus react. And so, you know, the more, the more tired you get, the more stupid everyone seems is yeah. what something Dan Sullivan was oh, just talking about. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, you notice the more fatigued you are, the more uh, annoying and more uh, ridiculous and stupid other people appear yes. to be, yes. you know, sort of thing. So, so um, what's something that you want to change about your life? Mm. You know, I, I love, that was a hard question for me when I just saw it earlier. Um, I, I don't have a life partner, you know, so I haven't done love well. Um, yeah. I, I have um, I've achieved success. I'm happy. I know my heart and I know my soul, my being, like that mm -hmm. to me. And I haven't found or made space or room. So I'm working with Annie. Great, great. Yeah, she's I, I, calling I, me on all this stuff. God, she's good. She, isn't she good? <laughs> she's yeah. so good. Yeah, she's the one that helped me, uh, you know, helped me with my profile, which you've read. Yeah. Using marketing to find true love and. And uh, as crazy as that sounds, it's sort of, it's, it's not really about using marketing, which sounds like trickery. It's really about using identifications of what you want and do what you don't want, what your standards are, what you're looking for, and being able to put it out in the world so that you can, um, you know, attract what it is that you're looking for. And when you have a tree that has ropes and all kinds of things pulling at it, that tree never grows straight. It's got roots that are, you know, weird in certain ways. It's interesting because I look at a lot of spiritual leaders that in some are, I think, incredibly authentic and others are the biggest frauds yeah. that the world actually perceives them as being, oh, they're so real. They're, you know, and, and while some of my friends, oh, what do you like about that person? Oh, they're so authentic. It's like, you have no fucking idea. They're just really good at faking authenticity. Like it, oh, Isn't that weird? Faking, yeah. There's a book. Faking yeah, it, authenticity. It, it, I'm it telling happens it. a lot. Yeah, and it, <laughs> and Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. You know what? Think about this, though. Think because I'm, I'm going. This will be a little bit of a tangent, but it ties into what you're saying. Is like I often think about like the who the world admires, and having seen a lot of these people behind the scenes in their worst stages, from yeah. frankly being in addiction groups and seeing these people. And the world looks up to them until you find something out about them. They get exposed or, they, or they're human or whatever. And when you would look at people on TV from politicians to sports figures to artists to celebrities, um, I mean, you name it, just all the, 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 the different people that attract followers and fame. And when people used to say, oh, the media is bullshit. Well, then there's this thing called social media as if somehow that makes it more real. And now when everyone is the head of their own PR department and the more that they edit things and they put it out there. So we've got a whole world where young people are viewing their worth based on how many followers they have. 
you know, we've talked about Instagram yeah. a little, and my idea is I want to do an Instagram movie of uh, uh, a documentary f to help kids realize that your worth is not based on how many followers you have, because what a lot of these young people don't know is all of that is strategized. Oh, yeah. It's all, uh, people are hired, uh, uh, and it's, you know, it's fake. And, I mean, I have people that I work with that you would think their lives are so amazing that are suicidal on a regular basis, but they just put Instagram things on, they put Facebook, and it's, and it's just like, and I sit and think of all these young people where, who do they admire now? Who are the role models? It's fucking thousands of fake things. Oh, and, yeah. and this worth is, you know, based on that. And then, you know, the, <laughs> this is gonna sell, you know, the largest group other than people over the age of 65 that have erectile dysfunction or, between, or males between 18 to 24 because they've consumed so many hundreds of hours of, of internet pornography. By the time they are holding hands or kissing someone, they can't even get aroused without that. And it's like, so you're thinking, like, I think love relationships are so difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, and even the, the people that, oh, I, you know, are, are, I, mean, I can count on one hand the couples that I know that really don't seem like at some point they have not gone through enormous struggles. Not that, not that there's not many, it's just yeah. my, my own experience with it. So um, just the fact that you say that publicly, yeah. most people <laughs> would not say that. And actually, I, I really like that. I mean, I really like it when someone's like, what would you like to change about your life? Oh, you know. So what are you going to do? Well, that do? was on my sheet. It was like, oh, find, find love. Um, why are not living by the ocean? Why do I live in Dallas? So there, those yeah. were my goals. <laughs> yeah. No, but those <laughs> are awesome. Yeah. yeah, they were. It was incredible to, to just look at that. Like, yeah, why don't I live by the ocean? What am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. So is there any real estate for sale? <laughs> All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with two seemingly completely non-related questions. Has anybody in here ever been married, dated, or is currently dating someone? <laughs> okay, good. Now, second question is, has anybody in here ever had to work with or has hired anybody else in their organization? Okay, cool. So as we go in here, I'm going to come back around and I'll explain to you why these two come together. But I want to loop back to something that Alex said. So Alex took us on the arc of contribution yesterday. And he had a series of questions that he had us ask. And I want to focus on something that happens for entrepreneurs in between these two. How do I get further ahead? And then he said, eventually we shift to how do I help my team? get further ahead. Any entrepreneur that makes it from here to here, right at this point of the arrow, has a massive realization. And that real, actually, it's not a realization. It's an acceptance of reality. And that reality is that in order for us to accomplish our vision, and in order for us to maximize our contribution, it will take a team. Now, this poses a challenge because most entrepreneurs, quite frankly, suck at hiring. <laughs> and they suck at bringing people on board. And what it does is it creates a lot of frustration. So what I want to cover today are three lessons that dating can teach us about building powerful teams. All right, so number one, fit, not skill. OK, now this is important. Now think about this if you're going in the dating process. If you go through the dating process and all you're looking for is skill, just imagine how it's going to turn out, right? I'm looking for someone that can cook really well. I'm looking for someone that can clean really well or makes a lot of money. Now, some of you, and I'm not going to ask for volunteers, but some of you may have learned this the hard way. OK, now, when we go into the hiring process, let me give you Five things what entrepreneurs love to do is we love to go out and we love to find the person that is the best designer, the best copywriter, the best social media person. I'm going to give you five other things that you ought to be considering in addition to those because skill set is not the end, it's the beginning. That's where the conversation starts. So five things. And again, it's all about fit. So what we're talking about here is alignment to these five things. And the first one is your vision. What are you trying to accomplish? Is the person aligned to your vision? or are they aligned to the job that you're currently looking to fill? There's a big difference between the two. If they're not aligned to your vision, you should not even be considering them. Second is values. Does this person look at the world the same way that you do? For example, our number one core value at Sixth Division is amaze. I don't believe in doing anything that's not amazing. As, Al, or as Travis commented downstairs in the middle of a conversation, he added slightly anal retentive, and that describes me. Now, here's why this is important. It's a value for us to amaze. If there's somebody who's OK with like good enough, we're not going to get along very well. And so we need to make sure that I understand. This presupposes that as an entrepreneur, we know what our own values are. And there's a process to go through to do that. But we have to make sure that the people we're bringing on board share our values. Otherwise, we're going to butt heads. Nothing's going to get done. 
Number three is attitude. And the way that I can best summarize this, I was at Fort Hood and the, in the military they have a phrase and it says, in the absence of further orders, attack. So the question here is, do they have an attitude of success? Do they know how to be successful? If I drop them in a room and I give them half of a set of instructions, can they finish the instructions and finish the project or do they sit down and curl up in the fetal position and start sucking their thumb, right? Okay, number four, environment. Now, I might find someone that is totally aligned to my vision someone who matches my values, someone who's got the right attitude, and somebody who is, has the greatest skill set ever. In my office, we play music 24-7, and it's loud. Two, two and a half. We go above two and a half, the neighbors come tell us to turn it down. If you can't work with music playing, you can't work with us. They have to be able to fit to the environment. And then the last one is chemistry. You've got to stop and consider. When you're going to bring another person on board, you have to consider what that new person will do to the overall chemistry of your team and your organization. When we were going to hire our office manager, we had two finalists, uh, maybe 20-year-old uh, lady, by far the most magnetic personality I've ever met in my life. And then we had an older single mom, raised four kids. One of the kids had special needs. And as we sat down to decide who we were going to hire, it boiled down to when people walk into our office and we have the mom, it creates an entirely different complexion in our office. Hey. And everybody else in the organization shows up differently when the mom's there as opposed to the 20 year old. So you've got to consider chemistry and, and if they're gonna be a fit for the chemistry you want. So fit, not skill. All right, number two, hiring, not interviewing. Now again, let's go back to the, like, what we like to pretend like is that we're clinical psychologists, right? So what we do is we go online and we search for the, we do Google, what's the best question to ask in an interview, right? And then we get a list of like the 19 questions asked. We'll tell you everything you ever need to know. And then we sit down and we ask the question. And then they give us an answer and we're sitting there on our side and we're like, yeah, that sounds like a really great answer, but I have no freaking idea what, idea what to do with the answer you just gave me. So we just nod our head and we check off on a list and we come back up and we say, okay, cool, next question. And we're like, well, you don't really sound like you're crazy and you kind of gave some good answers, so I guess I'll hire you. Now imagine what happens if we do that in the dating world. If you start to date and then you're about to get married and all you've done is you've just gone on dates and you've had conversations, how much do you really know about the person across the table. Not that much. So here's a process. We've identified what we want in terms of fit. Here's a process to actually identify if they're that person. It's hiring, not interviewing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a hiring process that's based on skill set exercises. Meaning, if somebody says, hey, I can build funnels and that's what the job requires, then we're gonna have them build a funnel in front of us. If somebody's supposed to manage my email, they're gonna manage my email in front of me. And we're gonna administer those skill set exercises in a way that will reveal character and attitude so that we can determine fit. So we were hiring our office manager, and um, the first assignment we gave her was, hey, I need you to plan a trip where I'm taking my daughter to the American Girl doll store, and then I've got to fly to a business thing to speak. And that was all the instruction we gave her. Again, I wanted to check, I want to check attitude. Can she just fill in the details? And then what I also wanted to see is, how does she send it back? Remember, number one core value for us is? Amaze. Amaze. So what I'm looking for is the person that will put together a Word doc, take our logo off of our website, put it into the header of the Word doc so it's styled. That's what I'm looking for. We got about five people that did that. And the person that we ended up hiring sent back, it was literally like a 10 page document. She had thought through travel plans, flight plans, like car, everything, and had our logo on top of the, on top of the document. So what we've done is I know she can do the job and I've set it up so that as she demonstrates that she can do the job or he, if that's who you're hiring, I know that they're gonna be a fit to both the culture and they have the right attitude. And so we should never, ever, ever hire. I was, at a, uh, I was at a conference recently, I talked to a guy, he's like, yeah, I've got 40 employees, and here's how I got them. I hired 400, and I fired 360. <laughs> Reminds me a lot of Joe, you, you, you quoted Dan Sullivan, uh, getting results doesn't take time, not getting them does, that reminds me a lot of that. What if we could just go hire the right 40? It ought to be that before we provide an offer, we already know that they can do the job and that they're gonna fit. We don't have to wait until afterwards and cross our fingers and hope. All right. Um, so that's number two, hiring, not interviewing. Number three, leadership, not management. So what I want to introduce to you is a matrix for leadership. Across the bar here, we've got challenge, okay? Low challenge is the person that does stuff for people as a leader. High challenge is where you require the person to learn and grow to be able to do what they're supposed to do. Support is your y-axis. High support is someone that says, hey, you're great. I'm behind you, I'm in your corner. Low support is the person that says, hey, you suck. Now let's go back to dating in any relationship. Anybody ever tried to manage a relationship instead of lead in a relationship? We wanna walk through this and I think you'll start to see where it comes in. So low challenge, low support as a leader is an abdicator. It means that you don't require anything of your employees and you don't also give them anything. And what you create is a culture of apathy and low expectation. I don't think anybody in this room is here. 
I don't think you get in this room if you're here. My guess is you're gonna find most of yourselves in here. Next is dominator. So you've got high challenge, low support. You demand a lot of the people on your team, but what you don't do is you don't create support to actually help them accomplish what it is that they need to be accomplishing, right? Think dating, same problem, not a good relationship to be in. Now, where I found most entrepreneurs that want to do something important in the world, they actually end up here, it's the protector. Right. And the protector is the person who has high support. I'm in your corner, you're great, low challenge. When something doesn't go quite right, instead of me forcing you to figure it out, I do it for you. Anybody in here ever stepped in and done something for an employee? as opposed to letting them learn how to go do it? I'm solid. Protector, now we get to the liberator. And this is where leadership comes in. The liberator is the person who has high challenge and high support. So when something doesn't go right, the liberator doesn't step in and fix it. The liberator says, hey, this didn't go right. I'm willing to have the conversation with you to establish the boundaries of, hey, this is what you were supposed to do and it didn't happen and you need to go fix it. And I'm here to help you. So leadership, not management. So I'll recap. And for those of you that don't speak Spanish, that stands for the recap. <laughs> Fit, not skill. When you're going to hire, skill set starts the conversation that does not end it. Second, hiring, not interviewing. You want to put them into skill set based activities that, will, that are administered in a way that allow you to determine their character and attitude. And then the last piece is leadership, not management. You want to be a liberator. You want to be the person who both supports them but also challenges them to learn and to grow. Now, for me, as I look at this, this is an equation. And the end result of this equation, if I draw a line right here, is you have a powerful culture and you have a powerful business. And a powerful culture and a powerful business can move mountains. And the reason why I think this is important goes back to our mission. Alex talked a lot yesterday about the entrepreneurial personality type. I don't believe that that's a separate set of people. I believe that it is something that's inside of everybody that just hasn't been awoke awakened yet. And I believe our responsibility as entrepreneurs is to do these three things so that what we can do is if we exist as powerful entrepreneurs, our employees can't help but exist as powerful people. And then we all go home and the families can't help but be powerful. And when families are powerful, communities are powerful. And when communities are powerful, nations are powerful. And that's how you change the world. How do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? So that's Ooh. the question. And so we, we picked questions. And when I say we, I mean my team has gone through like a thousand of these questions and we're, we're categorizing them. As we do these, we'll continue to answer them. And uh, so, uh, but they picked ones that they felt would be helpful to most people here also. So how do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? And the notes that I wrote to this, and then I'll have you go, Dean, is for mm -hmm. one, where do you want to stand out, right? It's one thing, like, why do you want to stand out in a crowded space? Can you niche it down, narrow it down, and, and be in a space where you're not so crowded? That's, right. That's one way to think about it. And then I want to say this up front, because this is going to apply to many of the messages, uh, questions that people will have, which is Dean Jackson's quote, about uh, a compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. Uh -oh. A compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. So write that down. We say it on almost every I Love Marketing Meetup group, uh, but it's worth, uh, it's worth understanding. So Dean, uh, answer that question if you could, sir. So this reminds me of this uh, thing we've been talking about where, especially in times where people are contracting, where you know, I'm assuming they say, how do I stand out and get people to do business with me? That's really what the essence of the question would be. Um, yeah. And the thing that is where the, all the competition is, is at the purchasing desk. That's what everybody's trying to get the attention of the purchasing desk saying, hey, give me a purchase order, give me a purchase order so that I can deliver these wonderful goods or services to you. And you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to compete for that attention. That's where it gets crowded. And one thing that just kind of dawned on me and things like this is that there is, almost zero competition at the receiving dock. And if you just go around to the building and bring things into the business, you're met with open arms. Everybody's 100% authorized in any business to bring money in to the business. So if you can, instead of spending time and money trying to fight for attention to convince somebody 
to give you business if you spent that same amount of time and attention on just getting a result for them and leading with that as opposed to um you know trying to uh convince them to give you business you, you're gonna find that it's a much easier path it's far easier anytime you have the possibility to give somebody a result for free to start the ball rolling that's going to be a win for you and it's easy to get attention when you're when you come bearing gifts money the thing that they that they want business you know that's really the um, that's really the the thing without knowing the context of what the um what the actual situation is but uh, i'm on the you call could, you could apply it to any oh you are okay there yeah. you go let's let's hear what aaron go ahead and uh, elaborate so i'm in the i'm in the real estate pirate industry we we're you know we buy the motivated seller houses yeah. and uh yeah. five years ago four years ago we could send out two or three thousand letters or postcards Yes. And be inundated with calls, like more calls than you could take in a two, three day period would come in. Now you can send 5,000 postcards and you're lucky if one or two people call. Right. So I switched it up. I went to the, the Genius Network annual event and I met the guys from Tulip Marketing. And I, and I had this idea, like maybe I'll do a newsletter and I'll send a newsletter out to kind of my target audience and bring value to them. And we did that for a few months. And it was like the calls we got were is this a joke? Is this a scam? Who are you? Why are you sending this? And very few people called in. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it produced, I thought delivering value and giving them, I mean, we're in California. So there's all kinds of information on, on the laws that are constantly changing and how it affects landlords. And that's really my primary market is marketing to burnt out landlords and then acquiring their properties. Mm -hmm. So I thought doing that, presenting a newsletter with a lot of content would, would generate more leads it, it, it didn't it didn't work so mm -hmm. now it's uh you know we have a lot of wall street buyers and silicon valley buyers in our market space now mm -hmm. uh it's just become very inundated with uh, uh bigger players who and they can spend a hundred thousand dollars a month on ad spend and being backed by silicon valley it's almost as if they don't need to show profit they just need to show revenue to get right. a million dollar valuation so yeah like, oh, we bought 800 houses last year. We made, you know, we lost $100 million, but worth, we're worth $5 billion now and we should go public. So yeah. you have the mom and pop guys like me who want to buy just 25 to 50 houses a year. And mm -hmm. across the board, we're all struggling. Mm -hmm. So what's your number one um, challenge, do you think? Like when you're, if you, how are you selecting the homes that you want to buy? So it's based on on criteria about the the type of house. Like I I know uh, very pinpointed on the type of property that I want to buy. So when a call comes in, it doesn't matter the situation or the seller. But I know that that house fits. It's a square peg a uh, plug a uh, peg in a square mm -hmm. you know hole situation. So we're mm -hmm. can I see one of the letters, Tina? Yeah. So we're trying to do stuff like. Like, you know, we're sending out letters and, you know, we're putting in like big dinosaur stamps and we're putting in like, you know, little hard stamps on the outside. Like, uh -huh. you know, I'm thinking like if, 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 if this shows up and it's addressed to, this one's addressed to Caesar and his wife gets it, the open rate on this is going to be a hundred percent because it has a nice big sure. heart stamp on the outside and the handwriting, yeah, right. is, you know, women's handwriting and blue ink. So, you know, yeah. there's a response from that, I don't know, but at least it gets opened in a red and then maybe we yeah. can elicit a response from that. And what's inside? What's the offer? So you're saying we want to buy your house? Call us. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's a little more personal. Uh, you know, we're, we're I can read you the letter. It's around here somewhere. Uh, but just, I mean, just the music yeah, of it it's, is it's, that. It just has some information about hey, I'm local. I'm a veteran, and uh, you know, I'm interested in buying your property. It's a really easy process. Uh, so yes. yeah, it's you know, typically you like yellow letter stuff. But yeah. I'm trying to do a little bit better on it. Like, mm -hmm. And how, how did Caesar get on the list? Uh, so this particular campaign is a uh, driving for dollars campaign where, you know, we have somebody who drives around and just looks at, looks for properties yeah. that have signs of financial distress, like a right. totally burnt lawn or it's overgrown, broken windows, bad roofs. So yeah. we have about a couple hundred properties on that list that, that somebody's visually driven by and seen and said, man, that's the distress situation. Yeah. Doesn't care. Got it. 
so if you're so then everybody on that list you're kind of like uh there they fit that bill correct and so you wonder what would happen with them over the next hundred weeks let's say over the next like if instead of thinking we're gonna mail the letter he's gonna say oh what a relief thank god somebody sent me this letter let's get out of this today uh but what if over the next hundred weeks if you looked at it how many of those are actually going to uh do something you know if you took like a longer um approach to it like instead of just one time like go going and uh you know i call it strip mining like just kind of going through mailing the letter they call that's how it used to be forever right you could just mail it they'd call and you'd buy and it all happened quickly but what if those those distressed houses are a problem um and even if they don't reply to your letter they're still a problem and what would happen over the next you know two years if you take a foul how many of those homes do you have on your uh list uh this one is 308 okay so of those 308 if you take that sort of longer term approach to it more than just like the one one um you know one kind of uh thing that i wonder what that would look like you know how how many of them actually do something how long have you been doing this now so in the past i i primarily have just mailed postcards for years okay. and then yeah. you know kind of this younger generation came into the business and yeah. they got into skip tracing and cold calling and test texting and yeah. voicemail and really just beat us older dudes out right so right <laughs> so now we've skip traced this whole list and we're going to you know, do the mail, but then hit them yeah. multiple times through different aspects. So we'll, we'll hit them with the mail. We'll uh, try to, uh, you know, find them on social media and, mm -hmm. and do some targeted marketing that way. Uh, but, you know, I open up my mailbox. I have dozens and dozens of rentals here and I open up my mailbox and there's, you know, multiple letters on a weekly basis from Sunday, from Open Door, from, yeah. you know, from all these companies that are, you know, doing basically the same thing, but yeah, you know, now with the heart stickers and handwritten. So yeah. Yeah, it is so. Um, yeah, it's a, it's it's noisy now, right? Like, and that's the thing is, what what would be the thing if you were to think would be a a, a softer step than uh, call us to buy it kind of thing? Like one of the things we do with the I work with traditional realtors who want to list those houses, right? And instead of mailing postcards that are, hey, list your house with me or call me and start packing or any of those, uh, you know, personal promotion things, we start offering people the uh, a report on uh, like the, you know, October 2020 report on Winter Haven Lakefront house prices to start the ball with somebody who's kind of moving forward. You know, what what else would they be looking at? Do you think these guys like what if they're not going to sell? What what do they need or what would be uh, uh, the answer to their problem? That, that's a great question. I've not been in that situation. So, right. uh, you know, we're, we're trying to discover that and and figure out how can we. Like, so we were doing the newsletter uh, and. and I thought it would be really effective. We had some, uh, you know, lawyer writing some stuff about yeah. the statewide rent control law and yeah, but very, I mean, not not inexpensive marketing strategy, but yeah. uh, you know, the return was not good. Yeah, yeah, very challenging. It is. So I think I would look maybe at the um, going back to the ones that you had from a year ago, kind of thing when they first come on that list and just to get a sense of how what is the scope of this how how because they're it um what we call visible prospects you know you know who they are and it's you know likely that they're going to um be they're going to do something at some point 
yeah, our card code enforcement eventually will get involved as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another opportunity may be to think upstream about who else is interested in, like not all distressed homes are, uh, are um, run down either. There's no visual. There's not necessarily 100% of the time um, visually distressed as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So part of the thing is I might look at aligning with a real estate agent who is also wants to get traditional listings you know are you a uh, licensed uh real estate yeah, agent? i'm a broker yeah okay so you know part of the thing is looking you may want to attempt that try the our getting listings program and then when the people reply uh you've got the opportunity of buying their house right there for them or then selling those leads to uh to a real estate agent who oh, wants I have an in-house to... agent that yeah we do that already oh you do okay yeah well that's what i got <laughs> okay. so I is, is, you. aaron is that helpful yeah, I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, this I, This is amazing that you guys are doing this. I just want to thank you very much. Been been yeah. fantastic. I love being on these calls. So, yeah, thanks a lot, Dean. I, I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, and let me always mention this, too. Even though we have a, you know, podcast here called I Love Marketing, and there's so many answers on specific topics that you guys can go and listen to uh, that, are, you know, that are there for free. Um, I wish we didn't have to do any of this marketing stuff. I mm -hmm. wish people would just do business with us because, you know, we were caring and we were, you know, kind and we delivered products and services, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a very competitive world. And so the purpose of marketing is if this was easy, everybody would be rich. Everyone would be doing well. And, and it just isn't. And so the more that you can, uh, invest, uh, you know, marketing is applied psychology. It's what you say and who you say it to. And I have met, uh, people that have mastered uh, different areas of marketing that know more about human behavior than many psychologists that I've met because they have to not just understand what people uh, do and what causes them to do the things they do, but getting someone to actually respond and to give you money and to pay attention to you. And, and so there's, there's a lot to it. So whenever you're in a highly competitive market, uh, you have to you know find ways to actually uh, break through. And that requires you know constant uh, thinking about the um you know the mindset of, of the person i mean I, i've always liked the robert collier uh line where as a as a marketer as a copywriter you want to enter a conversation that's existing in the prospect's mind and so you know the the prospect has a conversation there's something that they have their to use a dan sullivan terminology they have their dangers they have their opportunities and they have their strengths and so we need to know what their dangers are we need to know what their opportunities are, what you can bring to them and and being able to get their attention in ma many ways by reinforcing their strengths. So, and if anyone, uh, this is not really a marketing book, uh, but I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. It's called The Dan Sullivan Question. It's all about that. Highly recommend reading that book. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you wanna get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you wanna watch some more videos that'll be useful and awesome, Click here. Go ahead. Drove here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch her.